when you have a company, you want to make decisions for the future of this company. And the, the, the higher level decision that you can make is called an objective. This objective will be implemented by what's called the strategies. And these strategies will be implemented by what's called the four Ps. So the four Ps or the marketing mix are the same thing. The marketing mix is made of four Ps. Each P is supposed to represent the four pillars of the activities that you're gonna have. In each one of those P, you will have a sub strategy. So there's a strategy for the entire company, corporate strategies. The most common corporate strategies are new product development, market penetration, market development, and diversification. But there's many other corporate strategies which I have discussed uh, in previous lectures. And uh, then these are followed by the sub strategies. So there's strategies at the P level. So for the product, you have the product line extension strategy, you have the upstretch, downstretch, you have branding strategies that we'll discuss in a few minutes. But then you'll have these are strategies, not corporate, not company level strategies, but P level strategies. So they are not as um, N compassing as the corporate strategies, so they only the strategy that have an impact over one of the P. Then these P, each one of these P will have implementation, like detailed activities for each one of the P. And therefore this, these are gonna be called tactics. So tactics are small ideas that fulfill the sub strategies. The sub strategies are bigger ideas that fulfill the corporates, the company overall strategies, which are the overall uh, basic strategies, which are fulfilling the need of the objectives. So objectives are long-term, strategies are long-term, sub-strategies are also long-term, maybe a little bit less than the corporate strategies, and then tactics are short-term. The tactic will be to advertise in a specific social media. A uh, strategy will be to, a uh, sub-strategy will be to um, have multiple brands. Corporate strategy will be to have market penetration. And objective will be a certain amount of sales within a certain period of time. So that's the pyramid of all the decisions. So the product is important. And I discussed the fact that a product is a generic term for a place, a good, a service, an organization, an ID. I was talking about services, saying that services have four specific characteristics. It's not touchable, not storable, so it's intangible. It cannot be separated from the person who's producing it, so it's inseparable. It's variable because there are different people producing different ways. If you go to a hairdresser and you get your hair cut by different people, you will notice that it's the same hairdresser, same location, but it will be a different result. In fact, you may even get a different result from the same person at different times because people are not machines and they cannot do 100% the same performance every time that they work. And perishability is if it's not consumed at the, si at the same time as it's or just subsequently from the time that it's been produced, it's lost. So an hotel room, if there's nobody in the hotel room um, that night, that night room, if nobody is in there, it's lost. It's not like you can call a hotel and make a reservation for a, a day which happened two days ago or two years ago. It's gone. This hotel was empty two years ago, but right now it's full. And so you can't get the, the room when it was empty. There's someone inside. So that's what makes it complex with services is it varies. It's consumed at the same time. It's perishable and all that. Services also have different amount of um, involvement from the person uh, supplying the services and that makes a difference. So I was also talking about the different uh, layers of a product from the core, the actual and the augmented. I was talking about the four uh, categories of products, convenience, shopping, specialty and unsold. So convenience is the one that you will buy without thinking much uh, too much ahead and making too much comparison or buying from a specific store or being worried of making the wrong purchase because there's a risk um, in uh, acquiring this product and having to ch change it. 
shopping uh, goods are products where there's more risk, um, they are more expensive, you make comparison between different brands, different places. So a convenience, maybe candy versus a shopping good, maybe um, a dishwasher, for example. So you don't buy dishwasher every week. Uh, so what you buy every week is more convenience. And what you buy once and regularly for special occasions, like a graduation gown, for example, is a specialty good. It's something that is not just once in your life. It doesn't have to be such as a, um, a graduation gown, but it's something that is not very regular. It's, it's, it's more of a luxury, if you want. It's more of a high-end specialty, a premium product. It's something that you see big differences between the brands, big differences between the channel of distribution. Uh, you usually have a relationship with the brand, relationship with the channel of distribution. So that makes it a specialty good. Unsold goods are much more common. They are the goods that you um, don't know. And I spent some uh, time last time to define that, but it's the one that you don't know because you're not supposed to use because it's, let's say, a, a product that has to do with a gender and, or it's a product that has to do with a, a particular behavior or um, disability, and you don't have that disability. Uh, or more commonly, it's a product that you just don't know. So it's like a, a kite surf. You don't know much about surfing, you don't surf. And so thinking about buying a kite surf may not be something that you have in mind because it's very much of a ultra, ultra niche type of product. So, up, so part of the strategies is upstretch and downstretch. Part of the strategies is understanding that you have to come up with a product portfolio. And this product portfolio is really understanding the fact that you may have multiple products. And when you're creating new products, you create them within an existing category or you create a new category. So you have to understand width, depth, and length, up and downstretch. I mentioned about this. Then I was left. At, at this point where I was talking about the packaging and the importance of the packaging because it helps consumers recognize the product, but not only that, it enhances the product. So this is a brand of beer that was part of a movement called craft beer, um, which grew, started growing 15 years ago. Um, specific cities were very big on this, such as Austin or um, Seattle, Portland, San Diego. Uh, add some micro breweries that became bigger. And um, Ballast Point is one of them that was very successful. Um, and I would say a big part of their success has been the, the packaging that they used, which was really very much going against the grain of what was expected from a beer company. So it was more unexpected, it was more artistic, it was more uh, new and different. And that was part of what helps this product succeed is its packaging. So we see packaging is very important and sometimes that's one of the, the, the reason why they, they become successful, gogurt with the, the paste tube and sprinkles with obviously the tube, which is a format that allows people to, um, to, to get a very specific expected particular chip. So, Labeling is important to describe the product and also to help with the uh, gen code, the barcode, in order to keep stocks. Um, the labeling helps uh, to sell the product and it's important for people to see what, it, what this product is and not be confused. So here's an example of a product that I've been producing and um, I was producing it with a group of uh, partners and uh, they had an opinion of what was a good product. So that, that was the before. So we worked on the before. I was uh, never happy with this product, but when you have a partnership, sometimes you have to make compromises. And so this uh, product on the left um, had some big problems. Uh, one of them was that the bottle looked like a wine bottle. So people misinterpreted what was the product. The brand had to be read from up and down. So it created an extra effort which was originally perceived as a, as a benefit for the product. The fact that it would be harder to read, thinking people will therefore make the effort. And then when people make the effort, it helps them to memorize the brand. And that's true. If people make the efforts, they remember the brand. But people don't make the effort for the most part. So you're missing on people reading it at all. So 
you have a very small amount of people that read it, therefore a very small amount of people that remember it. Plus, the product was mostly uh, printed with stereography. Uh, the information was mostly printed. And so it didn't have much of a contrast. The contrast was very weak. So we developed the bottom, which is on the right side. And uh, we used um, uh, history and the, the concept of storytelling was what the product was about and why we had a label like this. And the brand was, became much more visible and, and what the product is about as well. Um, the product on the left, a lot of people didn't know what this was uh, versus now they are more um, clear. Sometimes also the packaging is what helps you to make uh, a big difference in your market. So this product is a very rare product that I um, produced. The idea behind this product was that the, the brandy was originally aged. So the brandy, the brandy is like a whiskey. So it's like a spirit was originally aged in a barrel in a cask made of wood, uh, which came from Japan. So it made some, not much, someone doesn't know, but they only allocate uh, less uh, than a hundred of these casks uh, to foreigners. And uh, so, so that year I was the only uh, person in France uh, to get a cask, an official cask, because some people, I don't know how they do that, but they sometimes are able to find a cask um, in the market uh, that has been used or something and uh, recycle it and so forth. We use the brand new cask and we put our brandy inside the brand new cask and therefore we wanted to create a packaging which had some uh, connection with Japan. And so we designed something that would be sort of Japanese with some influences, even the name of the product, we call it Ipon, which is a judo term that means the perfect movement. And then we used all kinds of little uh, elements for people to realize that this was a, a special product. So this, uh, obviously, when you know the price, most people uh, suddenly realize that it must have been quite special um, because it's a $15,000 um, bottle. So one bottle is $15,000. So products are important. The content is important. What it does is important, but how it looks is also very important. So here are different uh, brands of cars and I picked these in particular because they do look alike. There's a, a brand uh, from China called Jack, which I think you would agree the logo, um, the circle with the star inside is also very influenced by uh, Mercedes-Benz. But then when you look at their car, uh, you will find that there's also quite a lot of uh, similarity between their cars and Mercedes-Benz, but that's not the only one. There's another brand called Land Wind which these are not small, these are uh, huge uh, car company uh, in China. And so they are very inspired uh, to me, at least from the look, uh, very inspired to some other uh, cars. So the packaging is what makes people buy. And if you have a good packaging, if you have a good design, that helps them. So BYD is another huge conglomerate uh, that has an SUV that to me uh, seem uh, to be looking strangely uh, like a, another car. And uh, then the, this one as well is huge, Geely. And so there is some lookalike. So people buy with their eyes and what looks like maybe as good. People buy with the brand. So brands are very important. Brands are very, everywhere. Brands are important because they help people memorize, recognize and differentiate. And it gives brands some kind of identity. It gives people some feeling of reassurance that there is some quality, that there is some continuity, that there is some expectation that it's gonna be better and that they're gonna get the same um, product quality as they had last time because it's sort of, we're sort of reassured by the brand. It gives you also some legal protection because the brand is one way to differentiate with your competitors and it helps people keep interest in that brand and become loyal to that brand. So the brand is not just on the product, the brand is what you use to communicate. So communication is this concept of brand contact, which is that it's not just the logo on the brand, but the logo is on the uniforms, the logo is on the packaging, the logo is on advertising. And so this brand allows you to advertise and communicate about the brand. Brands have meanings, and that's what we call positioning. So if you look at the meaning of those different brands is they are associated with one word, 
So sometimes it's more than one word, but you would hope it must be one word. So the association is could be the benefits, it could be the story, the association could be the country where it's made, it could be um, the the people, uh, the owners, or the models and celebrity associated with this brand. So many type of association that you would want to have. Not going into too much depth on this, but the idea is that you want a brand for the most part that is likable, that can be transferred to other products than just the one product category. So you could be selling toothpaste, then you can sell toothbrush, then you can sell other dental products, and maybe it has to do with people's health, and then you do you go outside of the uh, dental health uh, because your brand can adapt. You want this brand to be protectable. So sometimes it's protectable for one category, so toothpaste, but it's not protectable for another category, which would be um, um, watches, for example. So the, the protection um, is an issue, and it could be an issue between countries where you can be protected in one country and you have to have a different brand in another country. So how do you evaluate brands? So the more common, traditional, older way to evaluate brands was to look at how much sales does that brand has. So the 1 million is not as highly evaluated as 100 millions, but it's also the growth. So how much was it five years ago? How much was it a year ago? How much is it right now? So that has an impact on the brand equity. But then another one is how do you compare with your uh, competitors? So there's a benchmarking of the brand. And then I would say there's another one, which is how much money will it take to create a comparable brand? Because sometimes the, um, there is people following it, but it goes up and down. But sometimes there's a time it takes to create brands. So th the time is um, not as important because now there's all kinds of means of com communication. So people can actually quickly uh, embrace a brand um, and some cultures will embrace a brand much quicker, a, a new brand much quicker than an old brand. So in Europe, if you create a new brand of car, it's gonna take a long time uh, to be embraced versus in the USA, for example, it takes half or much less time. So uh, just as an example, uh, Lexus, which was, which was a project, it was luxury US, that's what it was the name, luxury export US project, L-E-X-U-S was the name of the project. They were trying to sell an expensive Toyota and they were able to sell an expensive Toyota by changing the name because Toyota was not appropriate. And once they did that, they had much more success in Japan or in the USA than the other countries because the other countries were looking for some kind of heritage uh, element for the brand um, versus in America, the heritage element was not as important. And so um, heritage, the long heritage may have an impact on the brand equity as well. So big companies have multiple brands. Sometimes they have multiple brands for the same product, even for the same market. So I, I feel like saying it's possible to say that people don't buy products, but they buy brands. So if you're not a branded product, you are a commodity. So you're missing on the equity, on the additional value that your product could have by being a brand. Um, Think about a packaging, which brand is famous, Coca-Cola and Pringles again. Think about a brand, what about due to its taste? So again, Das ice cream and Guinness beer. Think about a brand and the difference between its design and its shape. So the brand is associated, its service, its image. Brands, they evolve. Uh, logo evolves, slogan evolves, and so you have this evolution because you want to adapt to your environment by being more representative, or close, closely representative to the target that you're focusing on. What is brand equity? So brand equity is a difference between a branded product and a non-branded product. That's a simple definition. Brand equity is more than the image of the brand. So if you say 
what the identity of the brand is, is brand equity. So that's part of it. So brand equity is made of multiple parts. And one of the definitions says that there are four parts. So this definition is uh, the one I'm, um, I believe uh, is uh, my favorite. So it's the one from Professor Acker, which talks about four groups makes brand equity. And these four groups are incremental, which means there's a low, lower level brand equity and there's a higher level brand equity. So you almost can look at it as a pyramid where at the top, this is like the, the best brand equity that you would have. So the least level of brand equity would be a brand that people will know what the brand is. So they go arrowhead. Oh, I think I already, I already, is it a brand of cigarettes or is it a brand of water? Oh, I think it's water. So that's brand awareness. They just heard about it. It's not like they've done, they've never seen it before. So obviously just thinking that you know the brand is not enough. It's, it's, it's definitely better than nothing. But the next level is you want them to say, I know I've seen this brand and I know what it's about. I know what it can be associated with. So what's the, the point of differentiation that this brand would have? So here we're really talking about the positioning. Then further into the positioning is not just knowing the meaning of the brand, what are the, the key uh, attributes, but it's also its scale on from zero quality to high quality. So the brands that people know, that they know what they do, what they mean, and are high on the scale of quality have the highest brand equity that allow them to have some fans. So fans allow the brand to develop some brand loyalty. What's the benefits of brand loyalty? Like the customers. Yeah, consistent customers and stuff. Exactly, consistent customers. So you have customers that will come back and consistent customers allow you to increase your profit because if you have consistent customers, they will do some word of mouth for you and that will improve your marketing. If you have consistent customers, it's possible even that you can lower your budget of marketing so you make more profit. If you have constant customers, it's easier to launch a new product because these regular fan customers will buy the new product because they like you. If you have consistent, constant customers, you will have a better relationship with the trade. So you have a trade leverage. That one's very important, but more complicated. Trade leverage is the idea that you offer a customer base and that the distributors, instead of selling a product that they don't know if anyone's gonna come, they have some mini, uh, less risk because they know people like this product and therefore they're gonna seek, search that product. Maybe come to their website, to their store for that product. And that's the, um, the if you remember in the strategies, there's also, oh no, it's not yet, but it's a, there's something called push and pull strategy. And I will talk about this. It's a strategy. It's a high level strategy that I didn't talk before because it's a strategy that usually has to do with distribution. So distribution is place. But the push and pull strategy says that co when consumers seek your product, then they will um, force the, the distributor to carry this product. So for example, I, one of my favorite uh, water is Avian. And therefore, I will go to a store that has Avian and have some loyalty to this brand because I like the taste. And therefore, I seek to buy all the other products from the distributors that carry this water. So as a matter of fact, almost everybody carries this water. So that's, that's easy. Um, so trade leverage is minimizing the bargaining power of the distributors and increasing the bargaining power of your brand. So there are multiple type of brands. There are some brands that exist by themselves. And then there are some brands that belong to a, a bigger company. So if you have Black & Decker as an example, they will make all their products called Black & Decker. So it's like a Black & Decker power drill. It's Black & Decker sander, Black & Decker battery tender, Black & Decker, it could be toothbrush, electric toothbrush and all this. So everything is Black & Decker. Then you may have a company that would have different brands for the, the different use. So if it's a professional product, they would have a brand. 
then if it's an home uh, user, you know, um, do it yourself, they would have a different brand. And then if it's no frills, they would have a different brand. But then if it's used in diff different situations, so for the bathroom, it will be one brand. For the kitchen, it will be another brand. So they'll, they'll change the brand. There's pros and cons of having those umbrella factory brands versus having a different brand for different models. If you have different models, it makes the brand more accurate to what it's supposed to do. So people are gonna trust that brand for that category much more because they're gonna see that they're not covering too much a variety of products. So it's more specific, more specialized, more precise. However, um, you're gonna to have to spend much more developing brands for every one of your categories versus if you have one brand for all. So there was one company as well that was doing that um, called Philips. Philips would have multiple brands in, um, no, sorry, sorry, they would have just one brand. So you could have the Philips radio, the Philips TV, the Philips shaver, the Philips coffee maker, the Philips air dryer. And so all of this was Philips. And one could say, how could Philips be a leader, uh, the best brand in so many different categories? So then you could say, can't we do something in between where we would have an emphasis on a, a brand, which is the model, and then we would have the, still the factory brand. So it's like, like a Volkswagen Beetle. So they really cultivate the model, the Beetle. And some people would say, I have a Beetle. That's just saying I have a Volkswagen Beetle because people will um, be so familiar with the model that that would be sort of the brand and you would not need to talk about the factory, the umbrella brand. But then having the umbrella brand also helps because then you have, um, every time you communicate about that model, you reinforce the factory brand and it's just, it's like two uh, birds for the price of one. I have a few, four little uh, brand strategies here. One is called the flankers. So the flankers is when you have multiple brands that you're selling. And the idea is to have more brands that you really should need. Why would you sell multiple brands in the market and not concentrate in having other brands? Why would you have multiple brands? It's like, it's very common um, for detergent, for example, they create one formula of detergent and then they create multiple brands for it. Hercil, Omo, but it's the same thing. It's all owned by Procter & Gamble. Why would you have so many of the same product with just different brands? If you own all the top brands of one uh, particular market, then you dominate that market. And then you're going to make, you're going to make profit and, and uh, um, a revenue no matter what. That's correct. So the, the idea behind this is very much an idea of domination. So it's domination of market share. You have the biggest percentage. So it's like, each one of your brand is only 5%, but you have 10 of them, so you have 50%. So you as a producer own 10, 50% of the market share, and it's easier to do that with multiple brands. It could be easier because what you will do is you will have slight um, differentiation for each one of those brands. The product could be the same, but you'll have different benefits so you say, this detergent really helps for stains. This detergent really helps for colors. It, you wash and it keeps the color. The other one is really remo remove the stains, but it's the same detergent. You would do this because people have different needs or they perceive they have different needs and therefore they will recognize themselves in those different brands and you will grow the market share that you will gain. Having said that, um, it will cost you more money. So you'd have to be careful um, with the, the, the extra cost of communicating with multiple brands. However, you also gain in what's called bargaining power because when you are a producer and you speak with a channel of distribution, so it's like you're a producer and you speak with um, Costco. Costco buys hundreds of thousands of your products. If you um, have multiple brands and they're buying these multiple brands, you have more weight to negotiate how much you're gonna sell the product. Costco, it's easier for them to negotiate in their favor, the less they buy from you. 
the more, more they buy from you, the harder it is for them to negotiate because they have more to lose. It's the, the weight that you have in their distribution. So Flankers allows you to grow your market share, Flankers allows you to grow your sales, and Flankers allows you to make it more difficult for competitors to enter the market and easier to negotiate with the sales of your product to the distributors who are going to try to squeeze you. Okay. Cash cows. So the cash cow, we talked about this before. It's the inside the matrix called Boston Consulting Group Matrix, the BCG matrix. And so the cash cow would be when you have a brand that you have a good market share, but it's not growing. So you're just generating revenue from this brand and you're not spending a lot of money. Then you could have a high hand uh, extension or low hand extension. So usually you will take advantage of the fact that you're considered high hand and then you're going to develop a sub brand that may have a totally different name or a name connected to the original brand. So Armani Exchange is not Armani and it allows people to, when you uh, lower uh, the prices and lower the quality and increase the distribution, not so much to alienate Armani and it allows you to, to get uh, more sales and eventually not increase your profit margin, but increase your profit overall because your profit margin on cheaper products are going to be less. Maybe you make, you know, 20% versus a luxury product. Maybe you make 100%, but you don't sell that many of the 100% and you sell many of the lower entry products. So a brand is important because people, like I said, buy the attributes, the image of the brand, and this image may have a personality. So we say the personality of the brand is either similar to the personality of the buyer or the buyer is borrowing from the personality of the brand in order to be interpreted as having the traits of the personality of the brand. So there are five brand strategies. So I don't want to confuse you here. These are not the corporate strategies. They are the strategies at the P level of product for branding and there are five. So if you say sell the same brand for the same category, it's called line extension. So you just uh, keep in changing the flavors and it's not changing the product tremendously. And that situation, you're just doing a, a depth uh, product line extension. The, you have a new brand name for an existing product category. So this is called the brand extension. So what you try to do is to use your existing brand in other categories. So the problem here is, can you, can you extend? So you have Barbie dolls, and now you have Barbie video games. I guess it's still for the same target. It's still for them to uh, play. So you could use the name Barbie because maybe they, it's for an older group of customers, um, but it's still young and youth and so forth. And therefore they will know Barbie and then they will trust the brand for their video games. But if you have to sell Barbie computer, maybe it would not work. Or uh, Barbie um, fruit juice, maybe it would not work because it's not associated with this type of uh, product category. Now you have same product category, multiple brands. So it's called multi-brands. And that sort of could be the reason of doing flanking. Um, the reason uh, flanking is, is really this reason of domination, but there could be also a multi-brand because it's a market that is, needs to be very differentiated where you have to have different products for different customers because they have different needs. And since you have different products, you'll have different brands. So there's a complete separation between the brands so people can develop more brand equity for them. That's also why uh, flanking and multi-brands are similar, but not exactly the same. And then new brands is when you have a new product category and a new brand. And the idea here is because you want to adapt the brand to this category because using the original brand that you're known for uh, is not appropriate. You cannot do the extension with the people being skeptical. And also because maybe you see a risk, a risk maybe because it's a new category. So you don't want um, to, to make mistakes 
and then regret having using your original brand that could be damaged. So you minimize the risk by creating an, an, an another brand specific for that category. Co-branding is here the fifth strategy is when you would have two brands being mentioned at the same time. And that would be for the benefit of borrowing from the meaning from each other brands and for the purpose of increasing the overall value of the product. You would have Intel inside on your IBM computer because you would want people to see IBM is a good computer and Intel is a good processor. And then they would be using uh, one another in order to increase the perceived value of the product. A product is a generic name for many things, including services. There's three levels of product, the core, the actual, and the augmented. There's four categories of product, convenient shopping, specialty, and unsought. You have multiple decision when it comes to the product line, such as stretch line and line extension. Brand equity is the difference between a branded product and non-branded product. It goes beyond just being the meaning. It goes beyond being the image. It takes advantage of the four characteristics of brand equity, which is awareness, association, quality, and loyalty. When you're a manufacturer, you can manufacture your products with your brand, or you can specifically pick different brands for different categories of products in order to minimize the risk or increase the competency of these brands for the different product category that they will be focused on. And then there are five brand strategies, line extension, brand extension, multi-brand, new brand, and co-branding. Cool now we're moving into, we're still in the concept of product mix, but I want to talk about new product development. So why I talk about this, because this is a very common uh, strategy that we have in marketing, which is to create new products. Um, you don't want to think it's the only one. Creating new product is expensive. And there is quite a mistake in constantly creating new product because you minimize the chances for your product to get to maturity. So if every year you create new product, maybe you are in the fashion business. If you are in the fashion business, you have to do new product development because it's the essence of your business. But if you are selling um, sodas, you don't have to create new soda every year. You may want to not allocate resources in creating new product, but allocate resources in promoting the existing product. So there's many ways to create new things. Let me give you, give you some examples. Um, Sarah Blakely, for example, she, she uh, now is part of the American billionaires, but her husband, her and her husband are very entrepreneurial. And so she had this idea of those special um, underwear, Spanx. So Spanx is special, and that's very common, which is that she thought of this product not because there was an opportunity. I mean, you can explain the opportunity, but she thought of this product because she wanted, it, she needed this product. This was a product that she wanted, but that didn't exist. So what it was, it was an underwear that once you wear it, it sort of makes your silhouette looks better. But these products already existed. I don't know when that started, the 50s, the 40s, maybe even before. Garters, and I mean, that started uh, 150 years ago. Sort of form-fitting uh, under uh, clothes existed, but this form-fitting underwear uh, we are not attractive. So she said, is there someone that makes attractive underwear, which are also form fitting? And so she created Spanx. She started uh, this business from her bedroom to the living room. And eventually she was able to sell hundreds of thousands of these by talking to distributors and retailers. And what she did is she sold the concept that the women want a better shape and they want to do that without surgery and they want an immediate result, but they don't want the uh, grand, uh, looking like a grandma in this underwear. They want it to look young and fashionable. So she created fashionable underwear that are compression. She uh, was successful because people could see the difference between the two right away. And then she had product line extension in the sense that she developed the bra as well and she developed many other accessories for women to enjoy the same performance. What was interesting is then she said, since we're doing this for women, why don't we do it with men? And so um, she developed different underwear for men as well, the men's spanks. By doing this, 
she unfortunately had some competitors. So one of them, which the name sounds the same, thinks uh, was developed and they started uh, developing the same type of product because it's very difficult, if not impossible, um, to protect um, a design for clothing and because clothing is all about fashion and so it's very, very difficult to have some kind of patent uh, for these. So sooner or later, you can imagine that there will be some competitors. So what is the first mover advantage when you innovate? Well, you get to choose who you're gonna sell the product to. So you choose the target. You may become the category prototype where people in fact think of you as being this style that started this. So it's like if you say a pair of jeans, you could say a pair of Levi's. People will understand that Levi's is jeans as well. You um, become the brand associated with the category but you also become the brand that the distributor want to support. So they want to support the brand that is the standard generic stereotype. And so it's kind of sad because the more they support that brand, the more that brand becomes big and the less they're supporting the small brand because that one is, they made it big. And as it's becoming big, the, those brand, because of brand loyalty, is they making it harder for the, for the trade, for the shops. And so the shops, you would think they have interest in developing a relationship where they are not giving too much power to the brand. And so in uh, branding and in distribution and in this concept of new product development, oftentimes the brand have created what's called private label. So private label is another brand strategy, which is not the brand strategy that uh, manufacturers of brand like. Um, it's almost like a necessity, uh, a bad thing that you end up having to do, but you don't want to do, is the brand that that are famous, oftentimes they will be asked by the distributor to create a sub brand that won't belong to the producer that will be purchased by the distributor. So that brand, it's like um, a soda brand, is they say, okay, well, carries RC Cola, but RC Cola, you would have to give us some of your support for producing uh, Safeway Cola. And by doing that, RC Cola is creating its own competitor. When you're the first one that does something is you have the advantage of the surprise, you have the advantage of being the one that they're gonna remember, but then you don't gain from previous efforts done by your competitors. Uh, you have to do everything. So you have the biggest uh, heavy uh, weight to lift because it's on all on your shoulder. So new product can come from buying a new, another company from buying a, li uh, a patent, a license, from looking overseas and then bringing this overseas ID in your domestic market, or from just looking at what the consumers are saying that's not working well and just adapting the product. Innovation is necessary. If there's no innovation, you're not gonna be able to keep your sales up. Eventually people get um, content and satisfied and they're not looking for something better. So you have to constantly create this better and let them know that it's better and why it's better and hope that what you make that is better is gonna generate enough interest for them to proceed and look for this product. The, 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 the issue with innovation is that there's different level of innovation. Innovation can be just a small detail. And if it's a small detail, it may not be enough for people to want to buy this product because of a small innovation or it could be a, a total disruption. And a total disruption, um, the problem, it takes more time to uh, be accepted. It costs much more money to develop, there's many more risk. And uh, there's even the risk that this product be better, but that people don't see it that way, that they don't understand. So product failed because the um, manufacturer didn't understand the targets and their motivation because there may be a change in your environment, uh, like a pandemic, uh, because it's more expensive to do than you thought. Um, because you, uh, when you made your decision to create this new product, you didn't do the research you were supposed to. Maybe you launched the product at a time that was not adequate. Not adequate because there's some conflict, but not adequate because there's a season, not adequate, because of events that happened during that period. 
or maybe because the, the, not everyone in the company agreed that it was necessary to launch this product, and therefore you get it, you're getting um, sort of a mixed support for this product. So products that work the well, the best, are the ones that have a clear advantage. And you can easily show the advantage. It's uh, visible, it's actionable, um, that they have no change of behavior. It's whatever, whatever they were doing before, it's still the same. But it's just that the pr product performs better and they're just getting more. Um, that there's no need to study in order to learn how to use this new product or the benefit of this new product. And that you can easily show the difference of the before and after. What was the product before and what it is right now and the benefit that that uh, change has accommodated. So when you um, sell products, you notice that you have to innovate, which means that there's products that are bought at the beginning and products are bought at the end of what will be the life cycle of the product. So innovators are the first people that buy the product. They are very important. Um, innovators are followed by early adopters Early adopters are not um, the last one because you have the early majority, late majority, and laggards. But early adopters possibly are the most important uh, group um, because you know, innovators are a very small group. And if your product is much better, it's easy. The innovators always look for something new. They look for improvements. So if you have improvements, you're going to quickly cross path with innovators. And innovators are going to be embracing your product without too much problems. They're going to spend more money for your product without too much problems. But once they buy your product, that doesn't mean that you're, you're getting in success. It's, it's too small of a group. What you want is you want them to roll into the process of going into the general larger population. And to do that, it's triggered by the early adopters. So the early adopters is what push you towards success. But the early adopters only exist if there is the innovators. So if you want, innovators is just a spark. It's not a fire. Versus the early adopt adopters is really the fire. And then with these fires, you anything can happen. But you need the fire in order for uh, anything serious to happen. Sparks is not going to do that. To, to look at these people uh, by contrast is that the late majority really is this group that starts buying your product when half or more than half of the people have been purchasing. So they come really late down the, uh, the, the path. So you could say uh, with this, talk about a, a movie, a new movie. The people are going to be watching this new movie first. The 2%, the 1%, the 3% that will be watching this movie first are really the innovators. These people that really care about cinema, they go to many movies, they have season tickets, they uh, read about the actors, they follow uh, th their blogs and so forth. So that's the innovators. Um, the early adopters are going to be the crowd that's going to be making the movement for that movie to become popular. So people don't understand uh, adopter groups oftentimes put too much emphasis on the innovators because without them, there would be nothing. It's true. But the one that generate the movement because they become substantial, because they sort of uh, are showing to the majority are the early adopters. The laggards is this group of people that, that never buy first. There may be some personality issues where they are worried about what's new. There may be some income, income and, and social class and education issue. Little education, little income, lower social classes, they tend to be the people that will end up in the laggards where they will buy products when it's the end of the cycle. So I was talking about the product life cycle. And so products that have been created become innovation and they enter what's called the introduction stage. Then they go into the growth stage, then the maturity, and then the decline. The graph 
can be um, a, a bell curve like this one, or it can be an inverted V, or it could be uh, there's all kinds of shape. It could go up and down, and as it goes up and down, it keeps going up. Um, what's important to know is that every product goes through an introduction and eventually goes into a decline. What's further, even more important to understand is therefore, for a company, you have to realize, understand, and apply the fact that you have to innovate. You want to innovate as much as possible in order to have constantly a balance between the product being introduced, the product being in the growth, the product. So you don't want to have 10 products where you have nine products in the introduction stage and one product in the growth stage. That's too many products still being new. So you will want a balance because what you want is the yellow line. You want a constant growth, constant sales, but which is supported by multiple shorter uh, product life cycles. So the overall growth exists, but it's supported by multiple lives. So when you look at the, the product life cycle, you also understand that there's different resources and support being implemented at the various stages. So in the introduction stage, the biggest focus in general, it's not always that way, but in general, is to get people to understand what the product is about and eventually try the product. In the growth stage, is to maximize the market share and to grow the profits. So in the growth stage, you know there is more market share that you could gain and you try to gain as much as possible. And at the same time, grow your profit. Um, in the maturity stage, this time is you reaching the maximum market share that you can grow and, um, and you defend your market share and you defend your um, your profit because your profit in terms of profit margin, the amount that you can make in percentage per product is going to go normally much smaller as your product grows in popularity. So at the beginning, you don't sell many products and you try to make the much, much the most money per product versus as your product is being uh, diffused and introduced in the market and the numbers are going up, is you're gonna be making less money per product, but more overall money because it will be balanced out by the number of products that you are selling. So maximize the profit and you defend your market share. You defend your market share because in the maturity stage, you have many more competitors. And in that stage, everyone is trying to reduce the prices and, um, Advertising is still expensive, but not as much as before. What makes a big difference in, ter in terms of the profit going down is the fact that you're reducing the prices. And then in the declining stage, that's when you are reducing the pricing so much that you may be not making any money anymore. And that's the sign that you need to stop selling this product because there's no profit to be made. So you're just milking the brand, you're selling this product to the laggards, and then the laggards are just making some profit and therefore it's worth uh, keep on selling this product. Not all products go through these stages because as you can see here, there's many products that are, go through um, a revival because they become popular again or they are being adapted, sort of uh, updated in order to keep on going. So Kinder Surprise uh, hasn't changed very much in the past 40 years. Nutella is the same thing. The Barbie dolls, so there's different Barbie being introduced with different fashions. Mr. Clean and Tic Tac, and then the Porsche 911 that keeps evolving, but it's always a question of keeping the essence of this vehicle from generation to generation in order for people to still recognize it. So it evolves, but it's not uh, too much evolution. So it's a balance between not enough which is gonna make people not wanna buy the new version and uh, too much, which is gonna make people not buy the new version as well, because maybe it's too far from what they're used to and they would rather have um, an older version. When you develop new products, you have two, two, 
two ways to develop new products. You have the, the most traditional is the sequential. So the sequential is you will have different function take each one of the stages. So you say stage one, it's the marketing. Stage two, it's operation. Stage three, it's accounting. And stage four, it's sales. So in each one of these stages, someone takes the responsibility of analyzing the new product and making a recommendation. In the simultaneous team-based process of new product development is you will have, instead of having people from the various functionalities go one after another, is you will be making groups with, in this group, so that, that team, people with uh, multiple um, functionalities. So if you look on the left side, the yellow boxes, in step one, let's say you have marketing and step two, you have accounting. And then the third and the fourth are again, a different function. In the team-based is you're gonna have representative of each one of the function in each one of the steps. So team-based is better because every time you make recommendation of what needs to happen in each one of the phases, which I'm gonna explain what are the phases, there are different perspectives from the various function inside the company making these decisions. So it's more, analyzed in each one of the phases by all the perspectives versus each phases with one perspective. So the problem with the team base, and the team base is better, I think you can tell it's obvious because it's more uh, precise and more uh, exhaustive, more complete. But the problem is it takes more time, um, it's uh, more expensive, you need more resources in order to have representative of each one of the team. And, you know, let's say you're a company with 10 people. Um, I guess you could do two, 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 and three, something like that. But it's, uh, it's easier when you're a smaller company to take the sequential because you could have one person takes care of the processes of new product development and do all of these one person. Versus in the team base is you're going to have have to have two people, stage one, two people, stage two, in order to have this multiplicity. So for big company, it's more recommended team-based. For small company, it's more practical to do sequential, but you, if you can, you, you may want to have some team uh, in order to have more representativeness of the different functions. Now, there are major steps in developing a new product. And in, essentially there are eight steps. So you, um, when you say, oh, we think the company should have a new product, is you have to understand that therefore the, that means the company is going to have to go through these eight steps. And they're going to have to go through these eight steps in the order uh, from this um, diagram. So the first thing is ID generation, which is that you're going to have to come up with as many IDs by brainstorming, by doing secondary data, um, interviews, questionnaires, experiment, um, talk to your staff, talk to your customers, is try to find IDs that will be supported by opportunities. The second stage is filtering these IDs in the one that makes the most sense. So the one that makes the most sense is the one that you can do faster with the least resources and get the best return on investment. Normal, um, the one that are more realistic, uh, maybe the ones that are more profitable, okay? Third stage is the concept development and testing. So at this time, you develop maybe the concept just on paper, just as a the 2D, 3D design, digital design, and then people can see it and give you uh, feedback and opinion. Then the fourth stage is to develop some marketing strategy. So what's the big corporate picture on how we're going to sell this? And took some uh, ideas of the tactics in order to fulfill the strategies. Then the business analysis is budgeting. So budgeting the cost of production, budgeting the cost of distribution, cost of communication, cost of inventory and, and uh, shipping and all of this. Then the sixth stage is to develop the product. So in that situation is you don't do the develop uh, the product um, as a, as a mock-up that you have as a third stage, but you develop a real product that it has full functionality. And then you go into the stage seven, which is to test it. So many ways to test it. One is to test it in one city. 
and not all the city and then deduce from that one city failure or success and adapt what you should do next. Or you test it in one store and then from that one store, you put it in many more stores or you test it inside what we discussed um, earlier this semester as, as one of the research method through an experiment, which is that you're gonna test it in a laboratory situation and observe people's behavior. And then finally, um, once you satisfy with your tests and you see it uh, be, being valuable and successful, is you do the full commercialization, which is that you're gonna go through the four stages of the product life cycle, being the introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. And then after that, again, is uh, the issue of creating a new product and adapting and so forth, all right? I'll stop here, here because it's a good um, end. So for the quiz, here it's the, the it's very important to learn the which one come first, which one come last, what are the orders, understand what which one is what and what's what are the description and definition of each one of them, understand what is product life cycle. Um, understand the, the, how many stages does it have, what are the main activity in each one of the stages. So that's usually seen as a difficult question, which is when I ask in the quiz, the final quiz, you know, uh, what, are, what is the name of the stage where you have to maximize profit and defend your market share? So for example, that one is oftentimes confused with the growth because they both talk about the profit, but it's a different profit. One is the profit as, as the percentage, and the other one is the profit as the overall dollar that you get to keep. So my profit is I made $3 million. My profit margin is 8.5%. So your profit margin is much bigger at the beginning and it gets smaller, but your profit as the overall usually gets bigger towards the maturity than it was because you sell many more products. Um, anyone has any questions? Sorry. I have a question. Oh, yes. uh, should a new brand establish their presence first or jump into new products as they develop their products? Okay, so, well, it's a very good question. And I have this graph that I sort of made myself where you see at the bottom, there's a P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. And so what I was trying to explain here is intuitively, my best recommendation, and it's sort of a rare that you get a formula like that, it's almost mathematical, is so you understand that you, if you put all your eggs in one basket, you, you risk of failing. So you want to have a diffusion of your baskets. So the diffusion of the baskets is the idea that if you're introducing a product, once you're, this product that you have introduced is inside the growth stage, you should have one come inside the introduction stage. So in other words, to make it simple and mathematic, if you have four products, it would be okay if you have one on each one of the stages. And the minute you have one, the declining one that you remove, that means that you, at that same time, you should have one that you introduce. So it's like, a, it's like a, someone that does jungling in a circus. Is, you, is in order to have one ball in each one of your hand, and one has to be in the air. And then if you have, if you have four balls, two needs to be in the air. And if you have five balls, uh, three needs to be in the air, right? And so it's, it's managing this. So you can't, so companies do two mistakes, one, is they launch too many products at the same time. So then they go, great, we're gonna launch five. And then we see what sticks. By launching five, you put all these resources on so many products, can you really afford five? You know, it would be like someone saying, um, I want 11 kids. Why? Because that way I can have a soccer team or something. Well, yeah, but 11 kids, you know, the work it is to take 11 kids, can you really love them equally? So then this person says, no, therefore I only have one. I can only love one. Yeah, but one, then you don't renew the population sort of thing because there's two people to make one. 
So you have to think, see what's the balance. And the balance is your resources, strengths and weaknesses. How many can we launch at once? Well, we have resources for two. Two is good because that way we diffuse the likelihood that one doesn't work. At least we have two. And then we, if we have two and it works, then we'll have two in the growth. And maybe two in the growth, later we have two in the maturity. So that's, that's good. A company that doesn't launch enough, obviously they're saving for the time being because it's more expensive to launch this because at the beginning you don't sell very much in general. And therefore they cost you more money that you gain from them. Later on, you make money. So the money you make from the growth maturity and decline you invest in your, the one that are in introduction and growth. And then the one you have in introduction of growth later, they'll be in the maturity, which you can use this money to put in a new introducing. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's really an act of, of equi equilibrium on the resources that you have, on the profit that you have. That's why when people say, oh, I don't like this company that makes profit. You need to make profit because profit is not because you want to get rich and spend it. It's you want to make profit because you reinvest it in research and development. So oftentimes people say that. I make profit to research, to invest in research and development. What do they mean? They mean inside those stages that are required because down the road, you're going to need these to be in maturity in order to create more profit to put inside. You know, and so that's how you have the longevity of your firm. Success as an entrepreneur is not doing it once, it's continuously doing it. I mean, we see that with um, companies like Apple that are constantly reinventing themselves, bringing new products, you have to. I mean, think, you may not be long, old enough, but Sony, there was a time you would ask someone, what do you want for Christmas? I want Sony. Everybody wanted Sony. Now you ask some, someone what they want for Christmas, I don't know that they'll say Sony very much. So obviously Sony is a company that was a leader for many years, probably a leader for longer than Apple has been so far. So let's see if Apple can do it as long as Sony. But if Apple starts thinking too much about taking advantage of their money right now and not investing it, keeping it for themselves, then they will fail. That's how they would fail. Or if they invest their money in the wrong product that they're introducing, then all the money went in these baskets and it's money that they have lost. And these are going to die products. And then they won't have as much money to reinvest into new products. That, so that's, that's, that's the story of business. That's the story of, of what we see. All right. Uh, but do you think that if they're a brand new company, shouldn't they establish what they do so people know what to go to them for? Oh, okay. So that question is, well, you should not because because you see, I'm not saying creating new brands, is I'm creating the new version. It's like, it's like um, Bill Gates saying, you know, we're gonna do Windows 1978 and let's not work on Windows 1981 because we want people to really love Windows 1978. Obviously one of the explanation of Bill Gates wealth, I mean, no, probably is going to be the vaccine, his biggest wealth, but the vaccine the, is wealth as we know it today from the software, from Windows. His biggest wealth from Windows was the fact that he had always an update. And so you have to, you have to create something that is perfect at one time and then create something that is more perfect than what you had before in order to be your own competitor. So you create uh, planned obsolescence. So even if you're very successful right now, you know that someone is going to take your spot and you don't want this someone to be your competitor. You want this someone to be yourself. So you have to imagine that you have no competitors and therefore create your own competition. So do, are you also saying to create your own industry? Your own industry. As Bill Gates, he he made what computers, and there wasn't really any. There weren't any real computers. Well, anymore. yeah. What you do is you 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 grow your market share. Right. You grow your market share so much that you you dominate, and you create a situation where your market share is so big 
that it's very difficult for anyone to enter. I mean, it's so, when you think about Windows, it's remarkable what they did because they were uh, free, alter they, they are free alternatives for Windows. You know, there's a company called Works, I believe. And so Works is Windows, but it's a free Windows. And it has existed for what, 25, 30 years? But people kept spending money on Windows and not getting their free works. Um, remarkable. So it kept people eyeballs going towards the Windows product. And so you've dominated, but I don't think you've dominated as creating your own industry, is you've dominated by creating the perception of this monopoly. So it's dominated not by saying, I'm going to dominate because I have a better product. So many people say that this is not the better product. And that's why Apple has regained some of this market share. Apple was always this 3 4% market share until they became 15, until they became 20, until they became 30, because they had a better product. And it took, took many, many years for people to see that because it takes money to make money and it takes money for, to direct people towards, you know, and so what Apple did is they did more than use money to direct people, is they created a movement. They created this uh, think different movement. Think different, think different. And people started thinking different to the point that they all started thinking the same, but uh, they stopped telling people think different once they reach a certain number of people buying the product, then they couldn't keep telling them think different because they could see everybody was thinking the same. So they went, then they moved to another perceptions but what you you cannot see the biggest problem when you have a business is one to make your first million and then is to keep up with the demand because once the demand comes then you you become sort of screwed because you cannot you know so they come and they ask for two times more then they come and they ask for three times more and now you're in the success and they ask for a thousand more so I'm not, I'm ready to double, I'm ready maybe to triple, but I'm not ready to multiply by a hundred or a thousand what I used to do. So scaling up is very difficult because, and the hardest thing I think is scaling up is not finding the money because there you will find the money if you need scaling up and it's obvious, investor will come. It's to find the people, the people that will keep the culture of the company the same as you scaling up and keep the skills and the focus of the people. I mean, if you Google or if you go on YouTube and you look for um, Steve Jobs videos on leadership and people, and you'll see when they ask him the question is what's the hardest thing to find? The hardest thing to find is managers. And why is it hard to find managers? Because the people that think they are managers, they're oftentimes the worst managers. And he said, when we were looking for managers, what we did is we found the best contributors the people that are team players and they are number one contributors in the team. They just love contributing and they don't want to be managers because they think managers suck. And that's him saying that. See, and he says, and there's people that don't want to be managers, but they're great contributors. And we tell them, okay, it's time. You're just a great contributors. So now we want you to manage people and teach them to be a contributor like you were and lead them to the path of greatest contribution. And that's the one, and one thing that he, that he says and you have to learn um, from Apple and um, Steve Jobs. And the second thing that he said is very remarkable. He says, you want to take people that don't think they are the experts because then the experts all they do is they fight for ego. You take those people that just have a passion and they're totally embracing the vision. And and so that's why you had, if you look at the video of when these guys were super successful, is they all young. And then you look at the uh, director of engineering, 23 years old, director of operation, 26 years old. I mean, that's the age of a lot of students in the class right now. And, and you go, what, um, how many billions were they managing? Billions, because they didn't have an ego. The ego was in the work. And so these were the type of managers they wanted, people that were 100% focused on the job and not so much them being right all the time. I don't want to take up anyone else's questions. I do have more. So if anyone else wants to chime in, um, I'll ask you in a little bit. If that's okay. Yeah, we'll keep going. Go ahead then. Okay, uh, just some follow up questions. So, so are you also saying that you should have you should be in one industry and then also 
start breaking into other industries with those new products or should the products be in one industry as a well, new company? So as a new company is you don't want to break in other industry too soon. As a new company, you, so I was telling you to establish and you ask, ask me, oh, should I establish on one? You don't want to establish on one is you want to keep the momentum on yourself. I think that was my point before. But when it comes to other industries is you want brand extension, you know, which is a, a new brand for a different category is a very difficult act because people oftentimes um, make the mistake of thinking that if they've done it well in one industry, they can do it in another. There's different rules. Uh, there's different cultures. Um, I, made the, I, I made this mistake, in fact, is I, at one time, um, I, uh, you know, I, I have a cognac company. So a cognac is a spirit product. So a spirit product is an alcohol that is like 40%. So it's very high volume. It's a cleaning alcohol, it's very high. And I did well, better, better, well, not so well, better, well, within the well thing, doing well. And then I said, hey, since I'm doing so well, I'm going to do sparkling wine. And so I went into the Champagne to give it a name. So sparkling wine is a type of Champagne. It's one of the best type of sparkling wine. And uh, this one thing for sure, it's more expensive. It's more expensive because it's more limited. It's more exclusive on all these different things. So it's French as well. And I said, I can do it. So then I started creating a, a brand of, of champagne, which I created with an importer and I started pushing it and all this. And I did very poorly. I didn't do poorly in the selection of the, of the blend because I actually won a gold medal in, uh, for best champagne and all that. It was highly rated, but I made a mistake because the people buy the, the store, like when you go to a store, let's say you put your feet in my shoes. When I go to a store, to sell my cognac, I speak to Bob because Bob is the buyer for spirits. So I have a relationship with Bob. Hi, Bob. Hi, Frank. Hi, Bob. Who is your son? Who is your daughter? I have a relationship. So then I said, okay, now I have a champagne. I'm going to go see Bob. Then I go to the store and I say, hi, Bob. I have a champagne. He says, oh, everything you do is great. I love to do business with you, but I'm not the buyer. This is the wine buyer. The wine buyer? Who's that? That's Jennifer. Man, I don't know Jennifer. So then I go, hi, I'm Frank. Oh, you're Frank? Okay, you're a number. Okay, here's the, here's where, send an email to this to my secretary, and then maybe she's going to give you an appointment. It's like, what? Normally I come here, I, I have a great cognac, everybody wants to talk to me, everybody wants to taste it, but they don't know me as the champagne. It's a different brand. I couldn't call my cognac and the champagne the same brand. Ooh, and in addition, when I open a bottle of cognac, so you have a bar, this is, not, this is avian because I want you to be safe and so forth. So this is, let's say a bottle of cognac when I open it, this bottle is gonna work for a month because a bottle of cognac doesn't get bad in a month. It gets bad maybe in a year when you open it. So I can serve this, I can put it in the bag, the bag I leave it in the sun, I take it back and all that. No, champagne is not like this. Champagne has to be consumed within the five minutes after it's opened, otherwise it degrades. And it has to be consumed super cold. So suddenly, gee, how am I going to go to meetings and do tastings from store to store? So then I bought myself a little fridge and it's a little fridge on a, tra a trailer. So my fridge trailer for the champagne has like 12 bottles. So that thing, I mean, at the end of the day, you can't tell your shoulder anymore. And every time I have to open a bottle, and then I open a bottle and this person says, okay, I'm going to try a little bit. So essentially then they, they drink this much of the champagne and then I have to throw away the bottle. So then at the end of the day, I threw away 12 bottles of champagne. I made X cells versus my cognac. That bottle, I can use it for a month. So cognac is a little bit more expensive than champagne, but not 45 times more expensive. It's only 12% more expensive. So gee, you have to take this into account when you make the margin. But the margin between champagne and cognac is about the same. How could it be? The, the tastings and the presentation cost you 50 times more expensive. I mean, I don't have to have this fridge uh, running behind me, you know, all these things. So that's what I'm trying to say. It's all of this. It's a big difference when you change the industry. And it's oftentimes the thing that you couldn't think of at the time. 
that you discover as you're doing it. You know, so, so when I ship champagne from France, there has to be a special container. So the container has to have like a, a, a pressure thing and all that. So the container is normally 3,500. Well, for the champagne, it's 4,500. Here's another thousand. It's every little bit. And I'm going to sell it for less. So it's going to cost me more to sell it. I'm going to sell it for less. Who wants to go in that kind of business? Well, because champagne is very seasonal, more seasonal. So then you can concentrate. Yes, it's true, but it's a different business. And that's what happens is I see all of these people when I meet with them, they are the champagne guy and that's all he does. There's the spirits person, that's all he does. And then there's the wine person, that's all they do. And because it's very different, it looks like the same, it all goes to your mouth, but it's a very different business in so many ways. So. So these things you learn, you know, from the experience. If you end up with a business that you build up and it, you didn't get from your parents, your parents are not going to tell you, oh, don't do that. Stop, stop, stop. I tell you why. And then you hear the story and then you go, ooh, maybe mommy and daddy were right. Maybe I have to be careful. And, and then you do it yourself as an entrepreneur and you just go, one day you get a slap, the next day you get a caress. And one day you get a slap, the next day a punch in the nose. And that's what being an entrepreneur is. You're learning. Nobody... Is telling you the truth, right? So therefore, if you have a successful brand in one category, uh, nurture this until you can lose it all and then you can change uh, industry and then see. That's good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any uh, other questions? Very good. Thanks again, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you for your question, Chris. Appreciate it. Um, I had a question, but um, I think like I know already like uh, uh, the answer. Oh, uh, you do. Uh, th is that why you came to my office hour? The same thing? No, it's not the same oh. question as you. Oh. But um, it's during the class, like you already give me the answer. So, oh, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Very good then. Yes. Thank you, Yannick, for letting me know. I was waiting to see if you were gonna jump. All right. Yeah. I have one more question. Sorry. Okay. Uh, what if you did? What if you were a new company and then you started more products in other industries? Should you retract those products and just focus on, I know you said if we were just starting to focus on our bread and butter, but what if we already established those things? Should we just take away from that and, and yeah, yeah. start working so, on it? It's funny because I, um, I, um, I met um, one of the co-founder of Taco Bell um, who was originally a policeman. And, and I was telling him the things I was doing. And I remember meeting with him because when you meet someone like that, very successful, it's always good to, to bounce on the wall, or whatever, because you gain from their experience. So he was a friend of a friend. He was right there. He said, hi, oh, he's right there. And we are talking about business. He's someone that likes to talk about business. And so I bounced a few of my, uh, of my projects and, and businesses. And you know, one was totally left and one was totally front, very different industries. So I, then I didn't want him to think that I was someone that was very um, distracted by all of these different things. But I, I pitched it to him and then he said, oh, you know what, you're doing really good because, and I tell you exactly what he said and I, I understood it very well. He said, it is very hard to make a dent with just one thing. So it's smart from you to try all of these different things because it's very hard to make a big dent with just one thing. So I know how he became rich and wealthy. It was it's a really cool story. So he was a policeman and he had breaks and every time he had break, he would look for uh, fast food. And eventually he saw that a lot of the, in Los Angeles he was. And then he saw a lot of people run to those Mexican truck. And then he says, what do they eat there? And then he ate there and he says, geez, that could be a cool fast food company. And then he decided to say, let's make a fast food company out of Mexican food. Hence the Taco Bell thing. But once he got Taco Bell rolling, he uh, got excited with the spices. So he developed a lot of spices, all the little bags that you get when you go to those restaurants. And then he made some special um, flavors, but then he says, you know what? I'm not gonna make this as a business of Taco Bell. I'm gonna create a separate business that makes the sauce and I sell it to Taco Bell. 
So I get an invoice from my own company for the sauce. And it was smart because one day someone came and said, how many billion do you want for the company? So he sold Taco Bell, but then those guys had to keep buying the sauce from him. So then he was not fast food person and sauce. He was just a sauce guy. And with the money that he got for the company, he went into real estate. So then he was doing so Mexican sauce for a uh, franchise, a Mexican, you know, Mexican restaurant and real estate. And then he specialized in real estate in um, restaurant real estate. So he would buy places that were famous restaurants because then he would, he would sell the restaurant business to another, you know, to uh, Wolfgang Puck or whatever you can think of. And so he specialized in that. So when you speak with him, he has really good, I mean, he has amazing formulas on how you manage a restaurant and all that. So he developed the skills of real estate, but at the same time is real estate in restaurants, skill that you learn from having so many franchise restaurants from Taco Bell, and at the same time, the sauce. So if you really think about it, it's all the same, but it's not really all the same. You just learn all of that within that context. So therefore, he didn't spread himself too thin. He was still together. So it's like someone saying, I make, I produce tennis rackets. And what else do you do? I build tennis courts. And then what else do you do? I build uh, tennis balls. Or what else do you do? I do um, a sport coaching franchise. You know, so it's like within the same world. What's tough is someone that would say, I'm, I invest in uh, music and uh, water and surfboards. And it's like, whoa, these are so different. That's just, how can you balance surfboard business, water business, and music business? These are usually the one that you hear later that nothing worked. Mm. Because they are just, they, their head were spinning and they were just losing it. Wow. That's really good. Genius, very genius. That's some. I'm glad I asked you that question. Thank you so much. You're welcome.